Welcome, my dear students of class 11, to this English class with me, your tutor, Atsinio Sikose. And today our topic is called Prayer Before Birth, written by Louis Magnus. So we are going to find out first about a little bit about the, the poet here. Frederick Louis Magnus was born in 1907 and died in 1963. So interestingly, if we take a look at the dates here, we, you will find that he had experienced both World War I, World War II. So this poem is actually written during the time of World War II, that is in 1944. So naturally, we are going to get a little bit about the background of war in our poem here. He is an Irish poet and playwright, which means he also writes drama. His poetry is marked with familiar topics, topics that everyone can uh, identify with. There is a lot of combination of contemporary ideas and images, the modern day uh, topics, in other words. The modern lives and its ills, it also reflect a lot about the ill of or the evilness of the modern day uh, life and social issues. So this poem, Prayer Before Birth, is a result of war experience. So that's what we can understand here. Now we would discuss this stanza wise. So the first stanza, prayer before birth. I am not yet born. Oh, hear me. Let not the blood sucking bat or rat or stot or the club footed gull come near me. So as we can see in the uh, topic, the title here, it's a prayer, it's a request and probably praying to God. And the, the speaker here is an unborn person. I am not yet born or an unborn child here. So this unborn child is praying to God. And it, in fact, the, the following two lines are very childlike. You know, children are afraid of a lot of imaginary things. So here, blood sucking bat or rat or stot, or for that matter, the club footed gull, an evil uh, spiritual being here. So these kind of things are also reflecting that the child is afraid of all these evil things, even in the spiritual realm here. So in other words, uh, this prayer is, the first stanza is a prayer for protection in the spiritual realm, expressing a childlike fear of harm. The possibility, in other words, of harm, even in that spiritual realm, is so great that the child is praying for protection. Second stanza, I am not yet born, console me. I fear that the human race may with tall walls wall me, with strong drugs dope me, with wise lies lure me, on black racks rack me, in blood baths roll me. So we have here the image of a war here. This unborn child is praying for uh, comfort, console me, praying for comfort. Why? Because this child or this unborn child is afraid of the human race. And why is it that he or she is afraid of the human race? Because it is full of evil with tall walls wall me. In other words, it can separate the child. It can create a lot of uh, dissension, separation in the child, within the society itself and in terms of opinions and ideas. With strong drugs dope me, referring to addictions here, it can also tempt the child to a lot of social ills such as addiction. With wise lies lure me. Take a look at the phrase wise lies here. Uh, the corruption of the world is such that it can uh, convince a person into doing evil things with wise, in a very clever way, fooling people. So that's why the child is praying for protection here. On black wrecks, wreck me. Remember, we have here an imaginary uh, imagery of um, war battlefield here. So it can torture me. In blood baths, roll me. And it can create a lot of bloodshed. So this world is full of evil that the child is asking for uh, comfort, protection. In fact, we have here the reflection of a human race who is full of corruption and war and oppression. <clears throat> the third stanza, I am not yet born, provide me with water to dandle me, 
grass to grow for me, trees to talk to me, sky to sing to me, birds and white light in the back of my mind to guide me. So interestingly, this is the only stanza that the poet has an optimistic view, or we can say the unborn child has an optimistic view here. We have here the picture or the personification of nature. When we say personification, uh, we mean that inanimate, not real objects are given character like human like characters that's what is called personification so the poet has personified nature as a very nurturing as a motherly figure here who is providing uh, guidance and in fact that's why this unborn child is saying that uh, asking or praying for provision. What kind of provision here? For water to play with me, grass to grow for me, trees to talk to me. In other words, this also reflects that the poet is very much concerned with the nature and environment. Sky to sing to me, birds and white light. If you take a look at the phrase white light here, it is uh, referring to wisdom knowledge we can also say god's guidance in the back of my mind to guide me so this child is praying for such kind of protection such kind of comfort or such kind of guidance to be more precise to for god's wisdom or knowledge to guide him and to to allow him to grow in a peaceful world so that's what we have here. So remember, nature is being personified as a benevolent and nurturing figure here. This stanza is the only stanza that is very optimistic of what the world can be. The fourth stanza. I am not yet born. Forgive me for the sins that in me the world shall commit my words. When they speak me, my thoughts, when they think me, my treason engendered by traitors beyond me, my life, when they murder by means of my hands, my death, when they leave me. So this stanza is a prayer for forgiveness. What kind of forgiveness? Forgiveness of sins sins or evils that would be committed by this unborn child eventually if he or she is being brought to the world or the way the world the corrupted world would manipulate this child into committing a lot of sins here the child is also asking for forgiveness of all those sins or uh, evils that would be committed against him so that's what we have here and it is interestingly the uh, the 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 unborn child is also asking for forgiveness in the way he or she would uh, commit sins through his words or thoughts and eventually commit a lot of evil such as crime and betrayal by traitors beyond me. I need you to take a look at this and uh, what does it imply here? It implies here that the child is very vulnerable, the unborn child is very vulnerable to be brought into this world. And why is that so? Because this child has no power or no authority or influence over the evil that would be influencing him eventually. So the, this is why the unborn child is saying that by traitors beyond me, it is out of his reach to control. The fifth stanza, I am not yet born, rehearse me in the parts I must play and the cues I must take. When old men lecture me, bureaucrats hector me, mountains frown at me, lovers laugh at me, the white waves call me to folly and the desert calls me to doom and the beggar refuses my gift and my children curse me. So that is the fifth stanza here. The first line in the first stanza, we have here a metaphor of a theater. Rehearse me. What kind of things is it referring to? The child is praying that uh, God should give him or her the guidance or to let him have this understanding of what kind of roles he must play when he or she is born in this world. And the cues, again the cues here, is, it could be referring to a script, a written script. Again, so in another, on the other hand, we can also understand it as the world is so animated in such a way that everything is being uh, expected of a child to behave in a certain way. It is so demarcated in that way that the child is saying, uh, 
are seeking for protection from all those kind of things. The script, you know, I must take when old men lecture me. How can I overcome uh, those kind of fierce opinions that old people, experienced people would uh, influence me. So seeking for guidance here. Bureaucrats hector me. People who are in uh, control, people who are leading, if they lecture me or if they suppress me. Mountains frown at me. Interestingly, in the previous stanza, we have uh, nature portrayed as a motherly, nurturing figure here. But now, mountains frown at me. Lovers laugh at me, the white waves call me to folly. Even when in times of, uh, you know, the world is so corrupted in such a way that the mankind evils, the gravity of mankind, of uh, evils of mankind is such that it can even manipulate nature into causing harm. So that's why we have here, mountains frown at me, the white waves call me to folly and the desert calls me to doom. The white waves, Interestingly, white represent peaceful, harmony, all those kind of things. But yet, this has been in mani manipulated in such a way that it can also cause mankind harm or even an innocent unborn child harm. So the desert calls me to doom. Desert calls me to tragic end. In, and the next phrase, the beggar refuses my gift. You know, beggar represents here poor people, but uh, weak people here. And yet, the corruption of the world is such that it can even influence a beggar who has no no choices uh, and who has no choice and he or she would also go to the extent of refusing the gift of life itself. My gift and my children curse me. The extent, the gravity of evil is such that it can even uh, le lead to the being influenced by that evil generation that can be passed down to the next generation as well. So that's why this unborn child is saying that a day might come when he or she would be cursed by his own children or her own children. So that is the gravity. We get the picture of the gravity, the, the evil of the world, the corrupted world here. So this is a prayer for protection, guidance from such kind of harms here. The sixth stanza, I am not yet born, oh hear me. This unborn child is pleading, let not the man who is beast or who thinks he is God come near me. We have here two kinds of evils that has been portrayed uh, in terms of beast and God. So mankind, the evil of mankind is compared to a beast and God. You know, we when we become so evil, we act like a beast without a conscience. So the world has come to such a, a stage here. In other words, that is the world that has been portrayed by Louis Magnus. And again, we have another uh, beastly nature of mankind that is acting like God himself, you know, with a lot of high-handed authority, with a lot of power, misuse of power, they can act like God. So that's why the child is asking for protection from such kind of evils not to give in into the ways of the world by temptation to live or become like a beast. He or she, this unborn child, does not want to become like a beast. So that is why uh, keep me from such kind of evils. That is his or her prayer. Or others who view themselves and act like God with authority. He does not want to become like a person who act like God himself with evilness in the core heart. So that's what we have here in the sixth stanza. <clears throat> the seventh stanza, I am not yet born, oh feel me with strength against those who would freeze my humanity, would dragon me into a lethal automation, would make me a cock in a machine, a thing with one face, a thing, and against all those who would dissipate my entirety, would blow me like thistle down, hither and thither, or hither and thither, like water held in hands would spill me. Let them not make me a stone, and let them not spill me, otherwise kill me. So the seventh stanza here is the last stanza. This phrase, I am not yet born, is being repeated again and again because the poet wants to emphasize the fact that even an innocent uh, child, an unborn child, can be 
brought to harm because of the evilness of the world, with strength that those who would freeze my humanity, the child, the unborn child is praying for strength against the world that would uh, influence, manipulate him in such a way that he or she would lose his humanity or love for mankind altogether. It would force him into a mere robot that is weaponized. You know, again, we have this picture of a war or a battlefield where soldiers are simply being trained to become a machine of war or for that matter, a machine to kill. So cock in a machine, this is, it means here a very insignificant role. A cock is a very insignificant role to, in other words, it implies here to lose identity, one's identity altogether. You are simply a machine turned into an object. And again, here is the theme of freedom that is being reflected here. Then lost his conscience, emotions and losing his entirety. The child is afraid of such kind of situations, losing his life and his world entirety altogether. Now, thistle down here is, a, it signifies the vulnerability in a corrupted world that will spill his life or killed him. Thistledown is a plant of a dandelion family and the seeds, you know, when it is all dried up, it can be with the slightest breeze, it can blow away. So like that, mankind, in other words, uh, the innocent of a child is such that it is so vulnerable that with the slightest influence, with the slightest impact of evil, it can be blown away, heather, theater. So that's what we have here. You know, when the wind blows, it goes with the direction of the wind. It does not have any control over its own life. So that's why it has been compared to that kind of a life. And in fact, the child or the unborn child wish for freedom. It does not want to be controlled. It does not want to be influenced by, by such kind of evils. He wishes to control his life and eventually seeking freedom here. So now let's take a look at the conclusion here. The theme is a plea, it is a prayer. A prayer of what kind of protection, of guidance? From what? From the evils of the world. So it is written in dramatic monologue. A dramatic monologue is uh, a record or a speech of a single person. So here, throughout the poem here, the speaker is the unborn child. And why the unborn child here, in fact, uh, the unborn child represents innocence and the poet that is Louis Magnus is using this, uh, this picture of an unborn child to give the message or his point of view. Now, we interestingly, we have here a juxtapose of innocence and evil, a juxtapose in the sense that uh, opposite ideas or opinions are being brought together and innocence represented by the unborn child and evil represented by the corrupted evil world here. So these two ideas are being brought together in such a way from the perspective of an unborn child who is afraid of the world because it is a very evil world that we, we are living in and it can turn an innocent child into a, uh, an object, a thing which has no identity. It can turn it into a cock in a machine. It can turn the child into a person without humanity. So that's why the child is praying, seeking for guidance. It talks a lot about the vulnerability of innocence. It, in other words, it talks a lot about how innocent people will find it a great struggle to survive. An unborn child, you, we all know that an, an unborn child or even a baby for that matter is a very innocent, pure at heart because it is not introduced to the evils of the world yet. So that's why we have here uh, the vulnerability of an innocent person or an unborn child portrayed here. It expresses, the poem expresses the repercussions, the effects that would uh, cause in the life of an evil uh, in the life of an unborn child. The gravity of evil of the, the world is such that it does not only harm an innocent unborn child, but it can eventually pass down to the next generation. You know, that's why the, the, uh, the unborn child is seeking for forgiveness that his or her children, when they curse 
him. So that's what we have here. We are also talking about the sub theme here is loss of identity or loss of freedom. The child does not want to be controlled. The child does not want to be lectured, hectored by uh, bureaucrats giving him or her the opinions and the, the, the opinions that are corrupted, the influence. He does not want to be manipulated. He does not want to want to be turned into a single object with no face at all and no identity. This fear make the child or the unborn child to pray for protection from such evils of the world. However, this poem is not all, all about gloom here. Remember, in one of the stanza, it also reflects about what the world can be, how the world can be a peaceful world here. So this is the perspective or the point of view of Louis Magnus. And remember, it is a result of the experiences of war, that is World War I and World War II. And this is the horror that he had experienced of the extent of mankind, how it would go about killing one another or harming one another and that the evils can also transcend into the next generation. It can harm an innocent child, even to the extent of an unborn child. Remember, in the first stanza, the child was afraid even to be uh, brought to harm in the spiritual realm. So the journey of an unborn child in this world is full of such kind of chaos and evils that exist in the world that exist in the world. So that's what we have here in this poem here. And on that note, we would be winding up today's class. Thank you all very much for joining me.